Chapter 10 Tierra del Fuego December 17, 1832, having now finished with Patagonia and the Falkland Islands, I will describe our first arrival in Tierra del Fuego. A little afternoon we doubled Cape St. Diego, and entered the famous Strait of L.E. Mayer. We kept close to the Fuegian shore, but the outline of the rugged, inhospitable Staten land was visible amidst the clouds. In the afternoon we anchored in the Bay of Good Success. While entering we were saluted in a manner becoming the inhabitants of this savage land. A group of Fuegians partly concealed by the entangled forest, were perched on a wild point overhanging the sea, and as we passed by, they sprang up and waving their tattered cloaks sent forth a loud and sonorous shout. The savages followed the ship, and just before dark we saw their fire, and again heard their wild cry. The harbor consists of a fine piece of water half surrounded by low rounded mountains of clay slate, which are covered to the water's edge by one dense gloomy forest. A single glance at the landscape was sufficient to show me how widely different it was from anything I had ever beheld. At night it blew a gale of wind, and heavy squalls from the mountains swept past us. It would have been a bad time out at sea, and we, as well as others, may call this good success bay. In the morning the captain sent a party to communicate with the Fuegians. When we came within hail, one of the four natives who were present advanced to receive us, and began to shout most vehemently, wishing to direct us where to land. When we were on shore the party looked rather alarmed, but continued talking and making gestures with great rapidity. It was without exception the most curious and interesting spectacle I ever beheld, I could not have believed how wide was the difference between savage and civilized man, it is greater than between a wild and domesticated animal, inasmuch as in man there is a greater power of improvement. The chief spokesman was old, and appeared to be the head of the family, the three others were powerful young men, about six feet high. The women and children had been sent away. These Fuegians are a very different race from the stunted, miserable wretches farther westward, and they seem closely allied to the famous Patagonians of the Strait of Magellan. Their only garment consists of a mantle made of guanaco skin, with the wool outside, this they wear just thrown over their shoulders, leaving their persons as often exposed as covered. Their skin is of a dirty coppery red color. The old man had a fillet of white feathers tied round his head which partly confined his black, coarse, and entangled hair. His face was crossed by two broad transverse bars, one, painted bright red, reached from ear to ear and included the upper lip, the other, white like chalk, extended above and parallel to the first, so that even his eyelids were thus colored. The other two men were ornamented by streaks of black powder, made of charcoal. The party altogether closely resembled the devils which come on the stage in plays like Der Free Schutz. Their very attitudes were abject, and the expression of their countenances distrustful, surprised, and startled. After we had presented them with some scarlet cloth, which they immediately tied round their necks, they became good friends. This was shown by the old man patting our breasts, and making a chuckling kind of noise as people do when feeding chickens. I walked with the old man, and this demonstration of friendship was repeated several times, it was concluded by three hard slaps, which were given me on the breast and back at the same time. He then bared his bosom for me to return the compliment, which being done, he seemed highly pleased. The language of these people, according to our notions, scarcely deserves to be called articulate. Captain Cook has compared it to a man clearing his throat, but certainly no European ever cleared his throat with so many hoarse, guttural, and clicking sounds. They are excellent mimics, as often as we coughed or yawned, or made any odd motion, they immediately imitated us. Some of our party began to squint and look awry, but one of the young Fuegians, whose whole face was painted black, excepting a white band across his eyes, succeeded in making far more hideous grimaces. They could repeat with perfect correctness each word in any sentence we addressed them, and they remembered such words for some time. 
Yet, we Europeans all know how difficult it is to distinguish apart the sounds in a foreign language. Which of us, for instance, could follow an American Indian through a sentence of more than three words? All savages appear to possess, to an uncommon degree, this power of mimicry. I was told, almost in the same words, of the same ludicrous habit among the Kaffirs, the Australians, likewise, have long been notorious for being able to imitate and describe the gait of any man, so that he may be recognized. How can this faculty be explained? Is it a consequence of the more practiced habits of perception and keener senses, common to all men in a savage state, as compared with those long civilized? When a song was struck up by our party, I thought the Fuegians would have fallen down with astonishment. With equal surprise they viewed our dancing, but one of the young men, when asked, had no objection to a little waltzing. Little accustomed to Europeans as they appeared to be, yet they knew and dreaded our firearms, nothing would tempt them to take a gun in their hands. They begged for knives, calling them by the Spanish word cuchilla. They explained also what they wanted, by acting as if they had a piece of blubber in their mouth, and then pretending to cut instead of tear it. I have not as yet noticed the Fuegians whom we had on board. During the former voyage of the Adventure and Beagle in 1826-1830, Captain Fitzroy seized on a party of natives, as hostages for the loss of a boat, which had been stolen, to the great jeopardy of a party employed on the survey, and some of these natives, as well as a child whom he bought for a pearl button, he took with him to England, determining to educate them and instruct them in religion at his own expense. To settle these natives in their own country, was one chief inducement to Captain Fitzroy to undertake our present voyage, and before the Admiralty had resolved to send out this expedition, Captain Fitzroy had generously chartered a vessel, and would himself have taken them back. The natives were accompanied by a missionary, R. Matthews, of whom and of the natives, Captain Fitzroy has published a full and excellent account. Two men, one of whom died in England of the smallpox, a boy and a little girl, were originally taken, and we had now on board, York Minster, Jemmy Button, whose name expresses his purchase money, and Fuegia Basket. York Minster was a full-grown, short, thick, powerful man, his disposition was reserved, taciturn, morose, and when excited violently passionate, his affections were very strong towards a few friends on board, his intellect good. Jemmy Button was a universal favorite, but likewise passionate, the expression of his face at once showed his nice disposition. He was merry and often laughed, and was remarkably sympathetic with anyone in pain, when the water was rough, I was often a little seasick and he used to come to me and say in a plaintive voice, Poor, poor fellow. But the notion, after his aquatic life, of a man being seasick, was too ludicrous, and he was generally obliged to turn on one side to hide a smile or laugh, and then he would repeat his poor, poor fellow. He was of a patriotic disposition, and he liked to praise his own tribe and country, in which he truly said there were plenty of trees, and he abused all the other tribes, he stoutly declared that there was no devil in his land. Jemmy was short, thick, and fat, but vain of his personal appearance, he used always to wear gloves, his hair was neatly cut, and he was distressed if his well-polished shoes were dirted. He was fond of admiring himself in a looking glass, and a merry-faced little Indian boy from the Rio Negro, whom we had for some months on board, soon perceived this, and used to mock him, Jemmy, who was always rather jealous of the attention paid to this little boy, did not at all like this, and used to say, with rather a contemptuous twist of his head, too much skylark. It seems yet wonderful to me, when I think over all his many good qualities that he should have been of the same race, and doubtless partaken of the same character, with the miserable, degraded savages whom we first met here. Lastly, Fuegia Basket was a nice, modest, reserved young girl, with a rather pleasing but sometimes sullen expression, and very quick in learning anything, especially languages. This she showed in picking up some Portuguese and Spanish, 
when left on shore for only a short time at Rio de Janeiro and Montevideo, and in her knowledge of English. York Minster was very jealous of any attention paid to her, for it was clear he determined to marry her as soon as they were settled on shore. Although all three could both speak and understand a good deal of English, it was singularly difficult to obtain much information from them, concerning the habits of their countrymen, this was partly owing to their apparent difficulty in understanding the simplest alternative. Everyone accustomed to very young children, knows how seldom one can get an answer even to so simple a question as whether a thing is black or white, the idea of black or white seems alternately to fill their minds. So it was with these Fuegians, and hence it was generally impossible to find out, by cross-questioning, whether one had rightly understood anything which they had asserted. Their sight was remarkably acute, it is well known that sailors, from long practice, can make out a distant object much better than a landsman, but both York and Jemmy were much superior to any sailor on board, several times they have declared what some distant object has been, and though doubted by every one, they have proved right, when it has been examined through a telescope. They were quite conscious of this power, and Jemmy, when he had any little quarrel with the officer on watch, would say, me see ship, me no tell. It was interesting to watch the conduct of the savages, when we landed, towards Jemmy Button, they immediately perceived the difference between him and ourselves, and held much conversation one with another on the subject. The old man addressed a long harangue to Jemmy, which it seems was to invite him to stay with them. But Jemmy understood very little of their language, and was, moreover, thoroughly ashamed of his countrymen. When York Minster afterwards came on shore, they noticed him in the same way, and told him he ought to shave, yet he had not twenty dwarf hairs on his face, whilst we all wore our untrimmed beards. They examined the color of his skin, and compared it with ours. One of our arms being bared, they expressed the liveliest surprise and admiration at its whiteness, just in the same way in which I have seen the orangutan do at the zoological gardens. We thought that they mistook two or three of the officers, who were rather shorter and fairer, though adorned with large beards, for the ladies of our party. The tallest amongst the Fuegians was evidently much pleased at his height being noticed. When placed back to back with the tallest of the boat's crew, he tried his best to edge on higher ground, and to stand on tiptoe. He opened his mouth to show his teeth, and turned his face for a side view and all this was done with such alacrity, that I dare say he thought himself the handsomest man in Tierra del Fuego. After our first feeling of grave astonishment was over, nothing could be more ludicrous than the odd mixture of surprise and imitation which these savages every moment exhibited. The next day I attempted to penetrate some way into the country. Tierra del Fuego may be described as a mountainous land, partly submerged in the sea, so that deep inlets and bays occupy the place where valleys should exist. The mountain sides, except on the exposed western coast, are covered from the water's edge upwards by one great forest. The trees reach to an elevation of between 1,000 and 1,500 feet, and are succeeded by a band of peat, with minute alpine plants, and this again is succeeded by the line of perpetual snow, which, according to Captain King, in the Strait of Magellan descends to between 3,000 and 4,000 feet. To find an acre of level land in any part of the country is most rare. I recollect only one little flat piece near Port Famine, and another of rather larger extent near Gori Road. In both places, and everywhere else, the surface is covered by a thick bed of swampy peat. Even within the forest, the ground is concealed by a mass of slowly putrefying vegetable matter, which, from being soaked with water, yields to the foot. Finding it nearly hopeless to push my way through the wood, I followed the course of a mountain torrent. At first, from the waterfalls and number of dead trees, I could hardly crawl along, but the bed of the stream soon became a little more open, from the floods having swept the sides. I continued slowly to advance for an hour along the broken and rocky banks, and was amply repaid by the grandeur of the scene. The gloomy depth of the ravine well accorded with the universal signs of violence. 
On every side were lying irregular masses of rock and torn up trees, other trees, though still erect, were decayed to the heart and ready to fall. The entangled mass of the thriving and the fallen reminded me of the forests within the tropics yet there was a difference, for in these still solitudes, death, instead of life, seemed the predominant spirit. I followed the water course till I came to a spot where a great slip had cleared a straight space down the mountain side. By this road I ascended to a considerable elevation, and obtained a good view of the surrounding woods. The trees all belong to one kind, the phagus betaloids, for the number of the other species of phagus and of the winter's bark, is quite inconsiderable. This beech keeps its leaves throughout the year, but its foliage is of a peculiar brownish-green color, with a tinge of yellow. As the whole landscape is thus colored, it has a somber, dull appearance, nor is it often enlivened by the rays of the sun. December 20th one side of the harbor is formed by a hill about 1500 feet high, which Captain Fitzroy has called after Sir J. Banks, in commemoration of his disastrous excursion, which proved fatal to two men of his party, and nearly so to Dr. Salander. The snowstorm, which was the cause of their misfortune, happened in the middle of January, corresponding to our July, and in the latitude of Durham. I was anxious to reach the summit of this mountain to collect alpine plants, for flowers of any kind in the lower parts are few in number. We followed the same water course as on the previous day, till it dwindled away, and we were then compelled to crawl blindly among the trees. These, from the effects of the elevation and of the impetuous winds, were low, thick and crooked. At length we reached that which from a distance appeared like a carpet of fine green turf, but which, to our vexation, turned out to be a compact mass of little beech trees about four or five feet high. They were as thick together as box in the border of a garden, and we were obliged to struggle over the flat but treacherous surface. After a little more trouble we gained the peat, and then the bare slate rock. A ridge connected this hill with another distant some miles, and more lofty, so that patches of snow were lying on it. As the day was not far advanced, I determined to walk there and collect plants along the road. It would have been very hard work, had it not been for a well-beaten and straight path made by the guanacos, for these animals, like sheep, always follow the same line. When we reached the hill we found it the highest in the immediate neighborhood and the waters flowed to the sea in opposite directions. We obtained a wide view over the surrounding country, to the north a swampy moorland extended, but to the south we had a scene of savage magnificence, well becoming Tierra del Fuego. There was a degree of mysterious grandeur in mountain behind mountain, with the deep intervening valleys, all covered by one thick, dusky mass of forest. The atmosphere, likewise, in this climate, where gale succeeds gale, with rain, hail, and sleet, seems blacker than anywhere else. In the Strait of Magellan, looking due southward from Port Famine, the distant channels between the mountains appeared from their gloominess to lead beyond the confines of this world. December 21st The Beagle got under way, and on the succeeding day, favored to an uncommon degree by a fine easterly breeze, we closed in with the barn belts, and running past Cape Deceit with its stony peaks, about three o'clock doubled the weather-beaten Cape Horn. The evening was calm and bright, and we enjoyed a fine view of the surrounding isles. Cape Horn, however, demanded his tribute, and before night sent us a gale of wind directly in our teeth. We stood out to sea, and on the second day again made the land when we saw on our weather bow this notorious promontory in its proper form veiled in a mist, and its dim outline surrounded by a storm of wind and water. Great black clouds were rolling across the heavens, and squalls of rain, with hail, swept by us with such extreme violence, that the captain determined to run into Wigwam Cove. This is a snug little harbor, not far from Cape Horn, and here, at Christmas Eve, we anchored in smooth water. The only thing which reminded us of the gale outside, was every now and then a puff from the mountains, which made the ship surge at her anchors. December 25th, close by the cove, 
a pointed hill, called Cater's Peak, rises to the height of 1700 feet. The surrounding islands all consist of conical masses of greenstone, associated sometimes with less regular hills of baked and altered clay slate. This part of Tierra del Fuego may be considered as the extremity of the submerged chain of mountains already alluded to. The cove takes its name of Wigwam from some of the Fuegian habitations, but every bay in the neighborhood might be so called with equal propriety. The inhabitants, living chiefly upon shellfish, are obliged constantly to change their place of residence, but they return at intervals to the same spots, as is evident from the piles of old shells which must often amount to many tons in freight. These heaps can be distinguished at a long distance by the bright green color of certain plants, which invariably grow on them. Among these may be enumerated the wild celery and scurvy grass, two very serviceable plants, the use of which has not been discovered by the natives. The Fuegian wigwam resembles, in size and dimensions, a haycock. It merely consists of a few broken branches stuck in the ground, and very imperfectly thatched on one side with a few tufts of grass and rushes. The hole cannot be the work of an hour, and it is only used for a few days. At Gori Roads I saw a place where one of these naked men had slept, which absolutely offered no more cover than the form of a hare. The man was evidently living by himself, and York Minster said he was very bad man, and that probably he had stolen something. On the west coast, however, the wigwams are rather better, for they are covered with seal skins. We were detained here several days by the bad weather. The climate is certainly wretched, the summer solstice was now past, yet every day snow fell on the hills, and in the valleys there was rain, accompanied by sleet. The thermometer generally stood about 45 degrees, but in the night fell to 38 or 40 degrees from the damp and boisterous state of the atmosphere, not cheered by a gleam of sunshine, one fancied the climate even worse than it really was. While going one day on shore near Wollaston Island, we pulled alongside a canoe with six Fuegians. These were the most abject and miserable creatures I anywhere beheld. On the east coast the natives, as we have seen, have guanaco cloaks, and on the west they possess seal skins. Amongst these central tribes the men generally have an otter skin, or some small scrap about as large as a pocket handkerchief, which is barely sufficient to cover their backs as low down as their loins. It is laced across the breast by strings, and according as the wind blows, it is shifted from side to side. But these Fuegians in the canoe were quite naked, and even one full-grown woman was absolutely so. It was raining heavily, and the fresh water, together with the spray, trickled down her body. In another harbor not far distant, a woman, who was suckling a recently born child, came one day alongside the vessel, and remained there out of mere curiosity, whilst the sleet fell and thought on her naked bosom, and on the skin of her naked baby. These poor wretches were stunted in their growth, their hideous faces bedaubed with white paint, their skins filthy and greasy their hair entangled, their voices discordant, and their gestures violent. Viewing such men, one can hardly make oneself believe that they are fellow creatures, and inhabitants of the same world. It is a common subject of conjecture what pleasure in life some of the lower animals can enjoy, how much more reasonably the same question may be asked with respect to these barbarians. At night, five or six human beings, naked and scarcely protected from the wind and rain of this tempestuous climate, sleep on the wet ground coiled up like animals. Whenever it is low water, winter, or summer, night or day, they must rise to pick shellfish from the rocks, and the women either dive to collect sea eggs, or sit patiently in their canoes, and with a baited hairline without any hook, jerk out little fish. If a seal is killed, or the floating carcass of a putrid whale is discovered, it is a feast, and such miserable food is assisted by a few tasteless berries and fungi. They often suffer from famine, I heard Mr. Lowe, a sealing master intimately acquainted with the natives of this country, give a curious account of the state of a party of 150 natives on the west coast, who were very thin and in great distress. 
A succession of gales prevented the women from getting shellfish on the rocks, and they could not go out in their canoes to catch seal. A small party of these men one morning set out, and the other Indians explained to him, that they were going a four days journey for food, on their return, Lo went to meet them, and he found them excessively tired, each man carrying a great square piece of putrid whale's blubber with a hole in the middle, through which they put their heads, like the gauchos do through their ponchos or cloaks. As soon as the blubber was brought into a wigwam, an old man cut off thin slices, and muttering over them, broiled them for a minute, and distributed them to the famished party, who during this time preserved a profound silence. Mr. Lowe believes that whenever a whale is cast on shore, the natives bury large pieces of it in the sand, as a resource in time of famine, and a native boy, whom he had on board, once found a stock thus buried. The different tribes when at war are cannibals. From the concurrent, but quite independent evidence of the boy taken by Mr. Lowe, and of Jemmy Button, it is certainly true, that when pressed in winter by hunger, they kill and devour their old women before they kill their dogs, the boy, being asked by Mr. Lowe why they did this, answered, doggies catch otters, old women no. This boy described the manner in which they are killed by being held over smoke and thus choked, he imitated their screams as a joke, and described the parts of their bodies which are considered best to eat. Horrid as such a death by the hands of their friends and relatives must be, the fears of the old women, when hunger begins to press, are more painful to think of, we are told that they then often run away into the mountains, but that they are pursued by the men and brought back to the slaughterhouse at their own firesides. Captain Fitzroy could never ascertain that the Fuegians have any distinct belief in a future life. They sometimes bury their dead in caves, and sometimes in the mountain forests, we do not know what ceremonies they perform. Jemmy Button would not eat land birds, because eat dead men, they are unwilling even to mention their dead friends. We have no reason to believe that they perform any sort of religious worship, though perhaps the muttering of the old man before he distributed the putrid blubber to his famished party, may be of this nature. Each family or tribe has a wizard or conjuring doctor, whose office we could never clearly ascertain. Jemmy believed in dreams, though not, as I have said, in the devil, I do not think that our Fuegians were much more superstitious than some of the sailors, for an old quartermaster firmly believed that the successive heavy gales, which we encountered off Cape Horn, were caused by our having the Fuegians on board. The nearest approach to a religious feeling which I heard of, was shown by York Minster, who, when Mr. Bino shot some very young ducklings as specimens, declared in the most solemn manner, Oh, Mr. Bino, much rain, snow, blow much. This was evidently a retributive punishment for wasting human food. In a wild and excited manner he also related, that his brother, one day whilst returning to pick up some dead birds which he had left on the coast, observed some feathers blown by the wind. His brother said, York imitating his manner, what that? And crawling onwards, he peeped over the cliff, and saw wild man picking his birds, he crawled a little nearer, and then hurled down a great stone and killed him. York declared for a long time afterwards storms raged, and much rain and snow fell. As far as we could make out, he seemed to consider the elements themselves as the avenging agents, it is evident in this case, how naturally, in a race a little more advanced in culture, the elements would become personified. What the bad wild men were, has always appeared to me most mysterious, from what York said, when we found the place like the form of a hare, where a single man had slept the night before, I should have thought that they were thieves who had been driven from their tribes, but other obscure speeches made me doubt this, I have sometimes imagined that the most probable explanation was that they were insane. The different tribes have no government or chief, yet each is surrounded by other hostile tribes, speaking different dialects, and separated from each other only by a deserted border or neutral territory, the cause of their warfare appears to be the means of subsistence. Their country is a broken mass of wild rocks, lofty hills, and useless forests, and these are viewed through mists and endless storms. 
the habitable land is reduced to the stones on the beach, in search of food they are compelled unceasingly to wander from spot to spot, and so steep is the coast, that they can only move about in their wretched canoes. They cannot know the feeling of having a home, and still less that of domestic affection, for the husband is to the wife a brutal master to a laborious slave. Was a more horrid deed ever perpetrated, than that witnessed on the west coast by Byron, who saw a wretched mother pick up her bleeding dying infant boy, whom her husband had mercilessly dashed on the stones for dropping a basket of sea eggs. How little can the higher powers of the mind be brought into play, what is there for imagination to picture, for reason to compare, or judgment to decide upon? To knock a limpet from the rock does not require even cunning, that lowest power of the mind. Their skill in some respects may be compared to the instinct of animals, for it is not improved by experience, the canoe, their most ingenious work, poor as it is, has remained the same, as we know from Drake, for the last two hundred and fifty years. Whilst beholding these savages, one asks, whence have they come? What could have tempted, or what change compelled a tribe of men, to leave the fine regions of the north, to travel down the Cordillera or backbone of America, to invent and build canoes, which are not used by the tribes of Chile, Peru, and Brazil, and then to enter on one of the most inhospitable countries within the limits of the globe? Although such reflections must at first seize on the mind, yet we may feel sure that they are partly erroneous. There is no reason to believe that the Fuegians decrease in number, therefore we must suppose that they enjoy a sufficient share of happiness, of whatever kind it may be, to render life worth having. Nature by making habit omnipotent, and its effects hereditary, has fitted the Fuegian to the climate and the productions of his miserable country. After having been detained six days in Wigwam Cove by very bad weather, we put to sea on the 30th of December. Captain Fitzroy wished to get westward to land York and Fuegia in their own country. When at sea we had a constant succession of gales, and the current was against us, we drifted to 57 degrees 23 minutes south. On the 11th of January 1833, by carrying a press of sail, we fetched within a few miles of the great rugged mountain of York Minster, so called by Captain Cook, and the origin of the name of the elder Fuegian, when a violent squall compelled us to shorten sail and stand out to sea. The surf was breaking fearfully on the coast, and the spray was carried over a cliff estimated to 200 feet in height. On the 12th the gale was very heavy, and we did not know exactly where we were, it was a most unpleasant sound to hear constantly repeated, keep a good look out to leeward. On the 13th the storm raged with its full fury, our horizon was narrowly limited by the sheets of spray borne by the wind. The sea looked ominous, like a dreary waving plain with patches of drifted snow, whilst the ship labored heavily, the albatross glided with its expanded wings right up the wind. At noon a great sea broke over us, and filled one of the whale boats, which was obliged to be instantly cut away. The poor beagle trembled at the shock, and for a few minutes would not obey her helm, but soon, like a good ship that she was, she righted and came up to the wind again. Had another sea followed the first, our fate would have been decided soon, and forever. We had now been twenty-four days trying in vain to get westward, the men were worn out with fatigue and they had not had for many nights or days a dry thing to put on. Captain Fitzroy gave up the attempt to get westward by the outside coast. In the evening we ran in behind False Cape Horn, and dropped our anchor in forty-seven fathoms, fire flashing from the windlass as the chain rushed round it. How delightful was that still night, after having been so long involved in the din of the warring elements. January 15, 1833 the Beagle anchored in Gori Roads. Captain Fitzroy having resolved to settle the Fuegians, according to their wishes, in Ponsonby Sound, four boats were equipped to carry them there through the Beagle Channel. This channel, which was discovered by Captain Fitzroy during the last voyage, is a most remarkable feature in the geography of this, or indeed of any other country, it may be compared to the Valley of Loch Ness in Scotland, with its chain of lakes and friths. 
It is about 120 miles long, with an average breadth, not subject to any very great variation, of about 2 miles, and is throughout the greater part so perfectly straight, that the view, bounded on each side by a line of mountains, gradually becomes indistinct in the long distance. It crosses the southern part of Tierra del Fuego in an east and west line, and in the middle is joined at right angles on the south side by an irregular channel, which has been called Ponsonby Sound. This is the residence of Jemmy Button's tribe and family. 19th, three whaleboats and the yawl, with a party of 28, started under the command of Captain Fitzroy. In the afternoon we entered the eastern mouth of the channel, and shortly afterwards found a snug little cove concealed by some surrounding islets. Here we pitched our tents and lighted our fires. Nothing could look more comfortable than this scene. The glassy water of the little harbor, with the branches of the trees hanging over the rocky beach, the boats at anchor, the tents supported by the crossed oars, and the smoke curling up the wooded valley, formed a picture of quiet retirement. The next day, 20th, we smoothly glided onwards in our little fleet, and came to a more inhabited district. Few if any of these natives could ever have seen a white man, certainly nothing could exceed their astonishment at the apparition of the four boats. Fires were lighted on every point, hence the name of Tierra del Fuego, or the Land of Fire, both to attract our attention and to spread far and wide the news. Some of the men ran for miles along the shore. I shall never forget how wild and savage one group appeared. Suddenly four or five men came to the edge of an overhanging cliff, they were absolutely naked, and their long hair streamed about their faces, they held rugged staffs in their hands, and, springing from the ground, they waved their arms round their heads, and sent forth the most hideous yells. At dinner time we landed among a party of Fuegians. At first they were not inclined to be friendly, for until the captain pulled in ahead of the other boats, they kept their slings in their hands. We soon, however, delighted them by trifling presents, such as tying red tape round their heads. They liked our biscuit, but one of the savages touched with his finger some of the meat preserved in tin cases which I was eating, and feeling it soft and cold, showed as much disgust at it, as I should have done at putrid blubber. Jemmy was thoroughly ashamed of his countrymen, and declared his own tribe were quite different, in which he was woefully mistaken. It was as easy to please as it was difficult to satisfy these savages. Young and old, men and children, never ceased repeating the word yammer schooner, which means give me. After pointing to almost every object, one after the other, even to the buttons on our coats, and saying their favorite word in as many intonations as possible, they would then use it in a neuter sense, and vacantly repeat yammer schooner. After yammer schoonering for any article very eagerly, they would by a simple artifice point to their young women or little children, as much as to say, if you will not give it me, surely you will to such as these. At night we endeavored in vain to find an uninhabited cove, and at last were obliged to bivouac not far from a party of natives. They were very inoffensive as long as they were few in numbers, but in the morning, 2 FIRST, being joined by others they showed symptoms of hostility, and we thought that we should have come to a skirmish. An European labors under great disadvantages when treating with savages like these, who have not the least idea of the power of firearms. In the very act of leveling his musket he appears to the savage far inferior to a man armed with a bow and arrow, a spear, or even a sling. Nor is it easy to teach them our superiority except by striking a fatal blow. Like wild beasts, they do not appear to compare numbers, for each individual, if attacked, instead of retiring, will endeavor to dash your brains out with a stone, as certainly as a tiger under similar circumstances would tear you. Captain Fitzroy on one occasion being very anxious, from good reasons, to frighten away a small party, first flourished a cutlass near them, at which they only laughed, he then twice fired his pistol close to a native. The man both times looked astounded, and carefully but quickly rubbed his head, he then stared a while, and gabbled to his companions, but he never seemed to think of running away. 
we can hardly put ourselves in the position of these savages, and understand their actions. In the case of this Fuegian, the possibility of such a sound as the report of a gun close to his ear could never have entered his mind. He perhaps literally did not for a second know whether it was a sound or a blow, and therefore very naturally rubbed his head. In a similar manner, when a savage sees a mark struck by a bullet, it may be some time before he is able at all to understand how it is affected, for the fact of a body being invisible from its velocity would perhaps be to him an idea totally inconceivable. Moreover, the extreme force of a bullet, that penetrates a hard substance without tearing it, may convince the savage that it has no force at all. Certainly, I believe that many savages of the lowest grade, such as these of Tierra del Fuego, have seen objects struck, and even small animals killed by the musket, without being in the least aware how deadly an instrument it is. Twenty-second, after having passed an unmolested night, in what would appear to be neutral territory between Jemmy's tribe and the people whom we saw yesterday, we sailed pleasantly along. I do not know anything which shows more clearly the hostile state of the different tribes, than these wide border or neutral tracks. Although Jemmy Button well knew the force of our party, he was, at first, unwilling to land amidst the hostile tribe nearest to his own. He often told us how the Savage Owns men when the leaf red, crossed the mountains from the eastern coast of Tierra del Fuego, and made inroads on the natives of this part of the country. It was most curious to watch him when thus talking, and see his eyes gleaming and his whole face assume a new and wild expression. As we proceeded along the Beagle Channel, the scenery assumed a peculiar and very magnificent character, but the effect was much lessened from the lowness of the point of view in a boat, and from looking along the valley, and thus losing all the beauty of a succession of ridges. The mountains were here about 3,000 feet high, and terminated in sharp and jagged points. They rose in one unbroken sweep from the water's edge, and were covered to the height of 14 or 1500 feet by the dusky colored forest. It was most curious to observe, as far as the eye could range, how level and truly horizontal the line on the mountainside was, at which trees ceased to grow, it precisely resembled the high water mark of driftweed on a sea beach. At night we slept close to the junction of Ponsonby Sound with the Beagle Channel. A small family of Fuegians, who were living in the cove, were quiet and inoffensive, and soon joined our party round a blazing fire. We were well clothed, and though sitting close to the fire were far from too warm, yet these naked savages, though further off, were observed, to our great surprise, to be streaming with perspiration at undergoing such a roasting. They seemed, however, very well pleased, and all joined in the chorus of the seamen's songs, but the manner in which they were invariably a little behindhand was quite ludicrous. During the night the news had spread, and early in the morning, 23rd, a fresh party arrived, belonging to the Teak Nika, or Jemmy's tribe. Several of them had run so fast that their noses were bleeding, and their mouths frothed from the rapidity with which they talked, and with their naked bodies all bedogged with black, white, and red, they looked like so many demoniacs who had been fighting. We then proceeded, accompanied by twelve canoes, each holding four or five people, down Ponsonby Sound to the spot where poor Jemmy expected to find his mother and relatives. He had already heard that his father was dead, but as he had had a dream in his head to that effect, he did not seem to care much about it, and repeatedly comforted himself with the very natural reflection, me no help it. He was not able to learn any particulars regarding his father's death, as his relations would not speak about it. Jemmy was now in a district well known to him, and guided the boats to a quiet pretty cove named Wulia, surrounded by islets, every one of which and every point had its proper native name. We found here a family of Jemmy's tribe, but not his relations, we made friends with them, and in the evening they sent a canoe to inform Jemmy's mother and brothers. The cove was bordered by some acres of good sloping land, not covered, as elsewhere, either by peat or by forest trees. Captain Fitzroy originally intended, as before stated, 
to have taken York Minster and Phoegia to their own tribe on the west coast, but as they expressed a wish to remain here, and as the spot was singularly favorable, Captain Fitzroy determined to settle here the whole party, including Matthews, the missionary. Five days were spent in building for them three large wigwams, in landing their goods, in digging two gardens, and sowing seeds. The next morning after our arrival, the 24th, the Fuegians began to pour in, and Jemmy's mother and brothers arrived. Jemmy recognized the stentorian voice of one of his brothers at a prodigious distance. The meeting was less interesting than that between a horse, turned out into a field, when he joins an old companion. There was no demonstration of affection, they simply stared for a short time at each other, and the mother immediately went to look after her canoe. We heard, however, through York that the mother has been inconsolable for the loss of Jemmy and had searched everywhere for him, thinking that he might have been left after having been taken in the boat. The women took much notice of and were very kind to Fuegia. We had already perceived that Jemmy had almost forgotten his own language. I should think there was scarcely another human being with so small a stock of language, for his English was very imperfect. It was laughable, but almost pitiable, to hear him speak to his wild brother in English, and then ask him in Spanish, no sabe. Whether he did not understand him. Everything went on peaceably during the three next days whilst the gardens were digging and wigwams building. We estimated the number of natives at about 120. The women worked hard, whilst the men lounged about all day long, watching us. They asked for everything they saw, and stole what they could. They were delighted at our dancing and singing, and were particularly interested at seeing us wash in a neighboring brook, they did not pay much attention to anything else, not even to our boats. Of all the things which York saw, during his absence from his country, nothing seems more to have astonished him than an ostrich, near Maldonado, breathless with astonishment he came running to Mr. Bino, with whom he was out walking oh, Mr. Bino, oh, bird all same horse. Much as our white skins surprised the natives, by Mr. Lowe's account a negro cook to a sealing vessel, did so more effectually, and the poor fellow was so mobbed and shouted at that he would never go on shore again. Everything went on so quietly that some of the officers and myself took long walks in the surrounding hills and woods. Suddenly, however, on the 27th, every woman and child disappeared. We were all uneasy at this, as neither York nor Jemmy could make out the cause. It was thought by some that they had been frightened by our cleaning and firing off our muskets on the previous evening, by others that it was owing to offense taken by an old savage, who, when told to keep further off, had coolly spit in the sentry's face, and had then, by gestures acted over a sleeping Fuegian, plainly showed, as it was said, that he should like to cut up and eat our man. Captain Fitzroy, to avoid the chance of an encounter, which would have been fatal to so many of the Fuegians, thought it advisable for us to sleep at a cove a few miles distant. Matthews, with his usual quiet fortitude, remarkable in a man apparently possessing little energy of character, determined to stay with the Fuegians, who evinced no alarm for themselves, and so we left them to pass their first awful night. On our return in the morning, 28th, we were delighted to find all quiet, and the men employed in their canoes spearing fish. Captain Fitzroy determined to send the yawl and one whale boat back to the ship, and to proceed with the two other boats, one under his own command, in which he most kindly allowed me to accompany him, and one under Mr. Hammond, to survey the western parts of the Beagle Channel, and afterwards to return and visit the settlement. The day to our astonishment was overpoweringly hot, so that our skins were scorched, with this beautiful weather, the view in the middle of the Beagle Channel was very remarkable. Looking towards either hand, no object intercepted the vanishing points of this long canal between the mountains. The circumstance of its being an arm of the sea was rendered very evident by several huge whales spouting in different directions. On one occasion I saw two of these monsters, probably male and female, slowly swimming one after the other, 
within less than a stone's throw of the shore, over which the beech tree extended its branches. We sailed on till it was dark, and then pitched our tents in a quiet creek. The greatest luxury was to find for our beds a beach of pebbles, for they were dry and yielded to the body. Peaty soil is damp, rock is uneven and hard, sand gets into one's meat, when cooked and eaten boat fashion, but when lying in our blanket bags, on a good bed of smooth pebbles, we passed most comfortable nights. It was my watch till one o'clock. There is something very solemn in these scenes. At no time does the consciousness in what a remote corner of the world you are then standing, come so strongly before the mind. Everything tends to this effect, the stillness of the night is interrupted only by the heavy breathing of the seamen beneath the tents, and sometimes by the cry of a night bird. The occasional barking of a dog, heard in the distance, reminds one that it is the land of the savage. January 20th, early in the morning we arrived at the point where the Beagle Channel divides into two arms, and we entered the northern one. The scenery here becomes even grander than before. The lofty mountains on the north side compose the granitic axis, or backbone of the country and boldly rise to a height of between three and 4,000 feet, with one peak above 6,000 feet. They are covered by a wide mantle of perpetual snow, and numerous cascades pour their waters, through the woods, into the narrow channel below. In many parts, magnificent glaciers extend from the mountainside to the water's edge. It is scarcely possible to imagine anything more beautiful than the barrel-like blue of these glaciers, and especially as contrasted with the dead white of the upper expanse of snow. The fragments which had fallen from the glacier into the water were floating away, and the channel with its icebergs presented, for the space of a mile, a miniature likeness of the polar sea. The boats being hauled on shore at our dinner hour, we were admiring from the distance of half a mile a perpendicular cliff of ice, and were wishing that some more fragments would fall. At last, down came a mass with a roaring noise, and immediately we saw the smooth outline of a wave traveling towards us. The men ran down as quickly as they could to the boats, for the chance of their being dashed to pieces was evident. One of the seamen just caught hold of the bows, as the curling breaker reached it, he was knocked over and over, but not hurt, and the boats, though thrice lifted on high and let fall again, received no damage. This was most fortunate for us, for we were a hundred miles distant from the ship, and we should have been left without provisions or firearms. I had previously observed that some large fragments of rock on the beach had been lately displaced, but until seeing this wave, I did not understand the cause. One side of the creek was formed by a spur of mica slate, the head by a cliff of ice about 40 feet high, and the other side by a promontory 50 feet high, built up of huge rounded fragments of granite and mica slate, out of which old trees were growing. This promontory was evidently a moraine, heaped up at a period when the glacier had greater dimensions. When we reached the western mouth of this northern branch of the Beagle Channel, we sailed amongst many unknown desolate islands, and the weather was wretchedly bad. We met with no natives. The coast was almost everywhere so steep, that we had several times to pull many miles before we could find space enough to pitch our two tents, one night we slept on large round boulders, with putrefying seaweed between them, and when the tide rose, we had to get up and move our blanket bags. The farthest point westward which we reached was Stewart Island, a distance of about 150 miles from our ship. We returned into the Beagle Channel by the southern arm, and thence proceeded, with no adventure, back to Ponsonby Sound. February 6, we arrived at Woolia. Matthews gave so bad an account of the conduct of the Fuegians, that Captain Fitzroy determined to take him back to the Beagle and ultimately he was left at New Zealand, where his brother was a missionary. From the time of our leaving, a regular system of plunder commenced, fresh parties of the natives kept arriving, York and Jemmy lost many things, and Matthews almost everything which had not been concealed underground. Every article seemed to have been torn up and divided by the natives. 
Matthews described the watch he was obliged always to keep as most harassing, night and day he was surrounded by the natives, who tried to tire him out by making an incessant noise close to his head. One day an old man, whom Matthews asked to leave his wigwam, immediately returned with a large stone in his hand, another day a whole party came armed with stones and stakes, and some of the younger men and Jemmy's brother were crying, Matthews met them with presents. Another party showed by signs that they wished to strip him naked and pluck all the hairs out of his face and body. I think we arrived just in time to save his life. Jemmy's relatives had been so vain and foolish, that they had showed to strangers their plunder, and their manner of obtaining it. It was quite melancholy leaving the three Fuegians with their savage countrymen, but it was a great comfort that they had no personal fears. York being a powerful resolute man, was pretty sure to get on well, together with his wife Fuegia. Poor Jemmy looked rather disconsolate, and would then, I have little doubt, have been glad to have returned with us. His own brother had stolen many things from him, and as he remarked, what fashion call that, he abused his countrymen, all bad men, no sabe, no, nothing and, though I never heard him swear before, damned fools. Our three Fuegians, though they had been only three years with civilized men, would, I am sure, have been glad to have retained their new habits, but this was obviously impossible. I fear it is more than doubtful, whether their visit will have been of any use to them. In the evening, with Matthews on board, we made sail back to the ship, not by the Beagle Channel, but by the southern coast. The boats were heavily laden and the sea rough, and we had a dangerous passage. By the evening of the 7th we were on board the Beagle after an absence of 20 days, during which time we had gone 300 miles in the open boats. On the 11th, Captain Fitzroy paid a visit by himself to the Fuegians and found them going on well, and that they had lost very few more things. On the last day of February in the succeeding year, 1834, the Beagle anchored in a beautiful little cove at the eastern entrance of the Beagle Channel. Captain Fitzroy determined on the bold, and as it proved successful, attempt to beat against the westerly winds by the same route, which we had followed in the boats to the settlement at Woolia. We did not see many natives until we were near Ponsonby Sound, where we were followed by ten or twelve canoes. The natives did not at all understand the reason of our tacking, and, instead of meeting us at each tack, vainly strove to follow us in our zigzag course. I was amused at finding what a difference the circumstance of being quite superior in force made, in the interest of beholding these savages. While in the boats I got to hate the very sound of their voices, so much trouble did they give us. The first and last word was Yammer Schooner. When, entering some quiet little cove, we have looked round and thought to pass a quiet night, the odious word yammer schooner has shrilly sounded from some gloomy nook, and then the little signal smoke has curled up to spread the news far and wide. On leaving some place we have said to each other, thank heaven, we have at last fairly left these wretches. When one more faint hello from an all-powerful voice, heard at a prodigious distance, would reach our ears, and clearly could we distinguish yammer schooner. But now, the more Fuegians the merrier, and very merry work it was. Both parties laughing, wondering, gaping at each other, we pitying them, for giving us good fish and crabs for rags, etc., they grasping at the chance of finding people so foolish as to exchange such splendid ornaments for a good supper. It was most amusing to see the undisguised smile of satisfaction with which one young woman with her face painted black, tied several bits of scarlet cloth round her head with rushes. Her husband, who enjoyed the very universal privilege in this country of possessing two wives, evidently became jealous of all the attention paid to his young wife, and, after a consultation with his naked beauties, was paddled away by them. Some of the Fuegians plainly showed that they had a fair notion of barter. I gave one man a large nail, a most valuable present, without making any signs for a return, but he immediately picked out two fish, and handed them up on the point of his spear. If any present was designed for one canoe, 
and it fell near another, it was invariably given to the right owner. The Fuegian boy, whom Mr. Lowe had on board showed, by going into the most violent passion, that he quite understood the reproach of being called a liar, which in truth he was. We were this time, as on all former occasions, much surprised at the little notice, or rather none whatever, which was taken of many things, the use of which must have been evident to the natives. Simple circumstances such as the beauty of scarlet cloth or blue beads, the absence of women, our care in washing ourselves, excited their admiration far more than any grand or complicated object, such as our ship. Bougainville has well remarked concerning these people, that they treat the chefs d'oeuvre d'industrie humaine, comme ils traitent les lois de la nature et ses phénomènes. On the 5th of March, we anchored in a cove at Woulia, but we saw not a soul there. We were alarmed at this, for the natives in Ponsonby Sound showed by gestures, that there had been fighting, and we afterwards heard that the dreaded Owens men had made a descent. Soon a canoe, with a little flag flying, was seen approaching, with one of the men in it washing the paint off his face. This man was poor Jemmy, now a thin, haggard savage, with long disordered hair, and naked, except a bit of blanket round his waist. We did not recognize him till he was close to us, for he was ashamed of himself, and turned his back to the ship. We had left him plump, fat, clean, and well-dressed, I never saw so complete and grievous a change. As soon, however, as he was clothed, and the first flurry was over, things wore a good appearance. He dined with Captain Fitzroy, and ate his dinner as tidily as formerly. He told us that he had too much, meaning enough, to eat, that he was not cold, that his relations were very good people, and that he did not wish to go back to England. In the evening we found out the cause of this great change in Jemmy's feelings, in the arrival of his young and nice-looking wife. With his usual good feeling he brought two beautiful otterskins for two of his best friends, and some spearheads and arrows made with his own hands for the captain. He said he had built a canoe for himself, and he boasted that he could talk a little of his own language. But it is a most singular fact, that he appears to have taught all his tribe some English, an old man spontaneously announced Jemmy Button's wife. Jemmy had lost all his property. He told us that York Minster had built a large canoe, and with his wife Fuegia, had several months since gone to his own country, and had taken farewell by an act of consummate villainy, he persuaded Jemmy and his mother to come with him, and then on the way deserted them by night, stealing every article of their property. Jemmy went to sleep on shore, and in the morning returned, and remained on board till the ship got under way, which frightened his wife, who continued crying violently till he got into his canoe. He returned loaded with valuable property. Every soul on board was heartily sorry to shake hands with him for the last time. I do not now doubt that he will be as happy as, perhaps happier than, if he had never left his own country. Everyone must sincerely hope that Captain Fitzroy's noble hope may be fulfilled, of being rewarded for the many generous sacrifices which he made for these Fuegians, by some shipwrecked sailor being protected by the descendants of Jemmy Button and his tribe. When Jemmy reached the shore, he lighted a signal fire, and the smoke curled up, bidding us a last and long farewell, as the ship stood on her course into the open sea. The perfect equality among the individuals composing the Fuegian tribes must for a long time retard their civilization. As we see those animals, whose instinct compels them to live in society and obey a chief, are most capable of improvement, so is it with the races of mankind. Whether we look at it as a cause or a consequence, the more civilized always have the most artificial governments. For instance, the inhabitants of Odahit, who, when first discovered, were governed by hereditary kings, had arrived at a far higher grade than another branch of the same people, the New Zealanders, who, although benefited by being compelled to turn their attention to agriculture, were republicans in the most absolute sense. In Tierra del Fuego, until some chief shall arise with power sufficient to secure any acquired advantage, 
such as the domesticated animals, it seems scarcely possible that the political state of the country can be improved. At present, even a piece of cloth given to one is torn into shreds and distributed, and no one individual becomes richer than another. On the other hand, it is difficult to understand how a chief can arise till there is property of some sort by which he might manifest his superiority and increase his power. I believe, in this extreme part of South America, man exists in a lower state of improvement than in any other part of the world. The South Sea Icelanders, of the two races inhabiting the Pacific, are comparatively civilized. The Eskimo in his subterranean hut, enjoys some of the comforts of life, and in his canoe, when fully equipped, manifests much skill. Some of the tribes of southern Africa prowling about in search of roots, and living concealed on the wild and arid plains, are sufficiently wretched. The Australian, in the simplicity of the arts of life, comes nearest the Fuegian, he can, however, boast of his boomerang, his spear and throwing stick, his method of climbing trees, of tracking animals, and of hunting. Although the Australian may be superior in acquirements, it by no means follows that he is likewise superior in mental capacity, indeed, from what I saw of the Fuegians when on board and from what I have read of the Australians, I should think the case was exactly the reverse. This substance, when dry, is tolerably compact, and of little specific gravity, Professor Ehrenberg has examined it, he states, Koenig Akkad der Wissen, Berlin, February 18, 45, that it is composed of infusoria, including 14 polygastrica, and 4 phytolitheria. He says that they are all inhabitants of fresh water, this is a beautiful example of the results obtainable through Professor Ehrenberg's microscopic researches, for Jemmy Button told me that it is always collected at the bottoms of mountain brooks. It is, moreover, a striking fact that in the geographical distribution of the infusoria, which are well known to have very wide ranges, that all the species in this substance, although brought from the extreme southern point of Tierra del Fuego, are old, known forms. One day, off the east coast of Tierra del Fuego, we saw a grand sight in several spermaceti whales jumping upright quite out of the water, with the exception of their tail fins. As they fell down sideways, they splashed the water high up, and the sound reverberated like a distant broadside. Captain Sullivan, who, since his voyage in the Beagle, has been employed on the survey of the Falkland Islands, heard from a sealer in 1842 that when in the western part of the Strait of Magellan, he was astonished by a native woman coming on board, who could talk some English. Without doubt this was Fuega Basket. She lived, I fear the term probably bears a double interpretation, some days on board.